good. Thank you. Jeff, excellent. Really, I, I must say I'm a little bit reluctant to stand and speak after that. It was so very uh, informative and clear. Um, Diesel is obviously a hot topic, so you were obviously our first choice to invite as guest speaker this year. Really interesting to hear your insights on North America. Um, also, to balance this difference between the perception of diesel and the potential of diesel. And I think, uh, as you pointed out so well, uh, we have an image problem. We don't have a technology or an emissions problem. Um, so really, really good. Thank you. Um, it takes a lot of time to prepare and, of course, to travel here and then to support us. So thank you for that. Uh, let's begin this year by looking at our series production. Um, normally when we get together at the AGM we review the growth over the past year and this year is different. We, we haven't had growth. We've been bumping around between 2 and 2.2 .2 million engine equivalents for two years now and it's understandable. That's quite a change from our track record and there have been some questions and some concern. Um, some shareholders have asked me if we're saturated, if this is our potential. Um, we're not saturated. Uh, we can see the programs that have been approved and will come to Sintercast foundries in the future. The development pipe looks uh, actually quite strong. Um, we're just in a little bit of a bridge at the moment, waiting for those programs to come out of the pipe. Um, I've also been asked if some of our foundries are starting to use other technologies for their new programs, and that's not at all the case. Uh, our foundry customers, they like and respect our technology. Uh, we have very good relationships with them. I think that we're a good supplier, and I think that we're good, a good partner. So I'm not at all concerned about that. Um, the reason that we haven't had growth lately is, it's simple, we just haven't had enough new engine programs start production. And what you see at the far end of this plot over the last uh, two years, that's our, our base production. That's what we have from all of our current programs. And historically, we've relied on new programs coming on stream to give us the growth. And what that does is, okay, first of all it gives us growth, but also it kind of masks or hides this variation that we see. Um, variation can come because one or two programs is low in a quarter. Um, it can come because we're in a shutdown period, whether it's the summer or the Christmas. And it can also come because of inventory adjustments. You know, our foundries don't ship directly to the customer, they ship to a warehouse. And from the warehouse, they'll have a very stable delivery to the OEM but the foundry production can come, go up and down depending on the inventory level in the warehouse. So you see a lot of these corrections. This bumping around is quite normal. Um, it's just that in previous years we didn't see it because we had other things ramping up and taking over the volume. Um, if we look at the first quarter production, because it's the most recent quarter as we come into the AGM, you see again that uh, the production is flat. We addressed this in the one quarter report. Um, we talked about three different programs that were low and, and caused us to be at the bottom of that 2 to 2.2 million range. And the first one is obviously the VM Motori. And Jeff referred to it and all indications are that it will come back very shortly. Um, this isn't something that affected us in the first quarter. If you think of model year 2017 vehicles, they normally start sale sometime in the summer of 2016. And our foundry production is uh, a couple of months before the vehicles come to the showrooms because of the, the lead time for the production and the distribution. So this has actually been a burden on our volume for almost a year now. And the other programs have performed really, really well to compensate for that. Um, in the first quarter report, we also referred to one passenger car program where the OEM was retooling the production line. And the reason for that retool was to increase the production capacity. So the OEM has done its forecasting. They decide that they need more engines. So they allocate investment to upgrade the line. And while they're upgrading it, they don't have as much access for production. Volumes go down. but if the OEM is putting in more money to increase the capacity, 
then we have to assume and expect that they're doing the right thing. The volume will come back and it should come back at a higher level. So we think that a lot of what we see now is temporary. Um, you know, if we have one engine program, it's quite common that it will be around 100,000 engines per year. And if it's that three liter V6 size, it means uh, 150,000 engine equivalents per year. And, and that's between 5 and 10% of our total production. So when one or two of those is low, it, it really drags down. And it's very difficult for the other programs to deliver a, a reasonable quarter. And the positive side of that is that when we get one new program, we also get around 150,000 engine equivalents. And we've come to the AGM year after year with uh, more than 10% annual growth. And it's fantastic for a company to have more than 10% growth. But in perspective, it really means one or two new engine programs per year. And, and I think that's very doable. And it has to be our, our, our goal to have one or two new programs every year. And therefore, we can sustain that good growth. So <laughs> upstairs, one of the shareholders said, you've had a bad start. Um, I don't think that the first quarter was a bad start. I think it was a slow start. We understand the reasons uh, that the volume was low. Um, it's temporary, it will come back. The development pipe looks good. Um, so we're, we're really confident in the potential. Um, we can look at the breakdown of the different programs. It's, it's more or less the same as last year, and that's logical because we haven't had new things coming on stream to make a big change in it. Um, we see development and uh, new products in each of these categories. Uh, in the question that uh, Torbjorn asked, I referred to the, two, to the five waves that we first introduced back in 2002. And at that time, uh, wave number three was inline diesels. We haven't hit that yet. However, that is in the development pipe. We will fill the five waves. We will deliver for inline diesels. Um, trucks, we've said for many years now, that's our biggest growth potential. Um, last year at the AGM, I referred to one truck program at one of our foundries that had ramped down. It was being transferred to another Sintercast foundry. So we had already had the ramp down at the first foundry, but it hadn't started production yet at the second foundry. So we were kind of down in the valley. Um, we had the press release from JMC Jangling Motors in China back on the 19th of April. And that closes that circle. So that program that was being transferred from one foundry to another foundry was the JMC 9-liter engine. JMC will also produce a 13-liter cylinder head in China. And that will give us an opportunity to start picking that volume back up. But again, that's one that's been low for us for more than a year. And it's been a real burden on the other programs. Um, industrial power. You know, trucks started to come to CGI with Euro 4 and Euro 5 emissions, kind of 2005 to 2010. And now that is starting for the off-road sector. There is a downsizing demand. There's a power-up demand. There's a fuel efficiency demand. And of course, emissions legislation coming to off-road as well. So uh, this thing isn't saturated. Uh, this thing is still early days. There's a lot of growth potential for us. Um, one of the things or one of the growth areas for us is obviously diesel and as Jeff said there's a headwind against diesel and a lot of negativity so I want to take some time today also to go through uh, how we see the diesel market development. This is a very interesting plot from AVL, the engine design consultancy firm in Austria. It's an international firm based from Austria. And it shows the fuel consumption in liters per 100 kilometers for gasoline engines and for diesel engines. And here you can see this clear gap between the fuel efficiency, something like 20 to 30 percent more fuel efficient. So as there is a pressure for the OEMs to reach CO2 targets, diesel is very helpful. And this plot shows that diesel is particularly helpful in the larger vehicles, which is exactly what Jeff had pointed out. Um, the CEO of Jaguar Land Rover, Dr. Speth, a few months ago, he said very powerfully, he said, if we have to meet these new CO2 targets, um, he said, for every OEM, diesel is needed 
There is no other way. So diesel will be a part of the vehicle mix, particularly as the standards become more difficult. Um, this plot is now from Bosch and, and from the ADAC in Germany. It's similar data but presented slightly differently. Um, it shows the blue line, which is the, the CO2 target in Europe for 2020-2021. And you can see that even for the small vehicles, the gasoline isn't meeting it. Gasoline isn't enough. It's going to have to be compounded with something. Probably 48 volt rather than an expensive hybrid powertrain. Um, but the diesel does meet it for the small vehicles. And as we then move toward larger vehicles, you can see that the disparity is bigger. Something needs to be done to get back to the CO2 limit. And what this graph shows very interestingly is not only the difference between gasoline and diesel, but also the difference between small vehicles and big vehicles. And it shows that big vehicles drive more miles. And so isn't it logical that that's where you make your environmental contribution on the bigger vehicles which consume, consume more fuel and also drive more miles? And that's where we work. Those are the ones that we're trying to help. Uh, just last week, uh, sorry, last month, um, Audi published this interesting graph where they compared their A4 with a petrol engine to uh, an A4 with a diesel engine, both 2 liter, both 140 kilowatts, about 185 horsepower. And you can see that the petrol engine is 30% less expensive to operate. Yeah? Um, and interestingly, that's because of the better fuel economy, but also the lower fuel prices. Um, more than 20 of the 28 European member states have diesel fuel less expensive than petrol, and usually by 10 to 20 percent. And, and this I thought was a very interesting plot, so I wanted to share it. This is from Toyota. It shows energy density, and, and now when we speak about the different types of energies, batteries and, and liquid fuels, so in the bottom left corner of the plot we see the density for different types of batteries. In the top left corner in the pink color for the gaseous fuels, so for example uh, uh, compressed natural gas or hydrogen, and in the upper right corner in green the liquid fuels. And what you can see in that is the one with the highest energy density is diesel. Yeah. And within the liquid fuels, we see how far to the left the ethanol is, and that's something that we all learned here in Sweden over the last five to ten years. Um, it was an interesting technology, but it just wasn't convenient to the driver. Yes? So some years ago, uh, two or three years ago, Toyota said that they weren't going to pursue electric vehicles. They said that there wasn't a big enough market for people who wanted to pay that high price for an electric vehicle to only have a limited driving range. And they were going to focus on hydrogen fuel cells. Now in the meantime, Toyota has changed that and they've said that they will have electric vehicles uh, for the Tokyo Olympics in 2020. Um, but what the plot shows very interestingly is with energy density, the blue in the bottom left that's why you need to plug in the electric vehicle for five hours to drive 200 kilometers. And the highest energy for diesel is why you can stand at the pump for five minutes to drive 800 kilometers. So the OEMs need it because it has a lower uh, CO2 emission. And the drivers want it because it has a cost advantage and a convenience. So it's a very desirable technology. What we have to do now is to work to solve the NOx. Yes, but we can't ban the technology. So there has been discussion about bans. It comes from some of the larger cities around the world. So we made a little bit of research and, and developed this summary. Um, what it shows is the current legislation and the proposed comment for the future. Um, London will require more than Euro 6 from 2020. They're not banning older cars. They're just saying that if you want to bring an older diesel into the city, you have to pay a surcharge of £12.50 per day. Today, the congestion charge to drive into central London is £11.50. So it's effectively double if you have an older diesel. Um, Paris, surprisingly, uh, the current standard is uh, more than Euro 4 uh, from 2020, not from today. The last Euro 4 engine was built in 2009 and the last Euro 4 car was sold in 2010. 
the average life of a car in Europe, <clears throat> excuse me, is 12 and a half years. They're letting some really old cars into the city. It's not so much about diesel, it's about old versus new. Um, in Stuttgart, they're contemplating having a, a, a requirement of greater than Euro 5 from 2018. Um, Oslo is already uh, Euro 5 since the beginning of this year. Um, in Athens, they talk about greater than Euro 5 in the central ring, and uh, 2025 is under discussion. And likewise, Mexico City, greater than Euro 5 from 2018 and 2025 under discussion. So the thing that strikes me is how can one discuss banning diesels in 2025 when one is also allowing Euro 4 vehicles in 2020? Isn't there a lot of room between Euro 4 and a ban? You know, couldn't you then ask for Euro 5 or Euro 6? Euro 7 is coming after 2020, so why not Euro 7? And the question that we want to provoke to the legislators is how can you ban diesel, rather discuss banning diesel today when you don't even know the potential of it in 2025? Maybe in 2025 it's the cleanest technology. The OEMs need it. So they are going to push the supply community for NOx solutions, right? So don't discuss a ban. Put up the targets. Today in Europe, uh, the, the NOx limit is 80 milligrams per kilometer. Change it to 40, change it to 20. We don't mind. Just set the target and don't choose the technology. Yeah? Anything that is under the limit, you can sell it and people can decide if they want to buy it. Anything that's over the limit, you can't sell it. And it doesn't matter what the name is. Yeah? Set the target, as Jeff said, get out of the way. So, the Volkswagen thing happened in September of 2015. That was kind of a starting gun for the supply community to say, right, we need to have solutions. And what I would like to do now is to go through a few solutions. A few weeks ago, I was at the Vienna Motor Symposium. It's the biggest engine conference of the year here in Europe, perhaps the biggest in the world. Um, there were two sessions on diesel. And in those two sessions, there were six papers that presented solutions. So imagine, September 2015, they had the wake-up call. They get to team together. They put some funding into it. They start to develop solutions. And before April 2017, they're able to publish solutions. So I just want to walk through some of those that were presented. Um, not in any particular order, just showing this one because it's a very good a graphic to show the toolbox that we have to work with. We have the engine out emissions. They go through the diesel oxidation catalyst. This is converting hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide to CO2 and water vapor. And we then inject this DEF. Uh, it's the American term, diesel exhaust fluid. Um, here in Europe, we call it AdBlue. It's ammonia. Yeah. So we push that into the uh, exhaust stream. It goes into the uh, selective catalytic reduction, where the NOx is reduced to nitrogen and water vapor. And what they've done lately is to combine the SCR with the particulate filter, so you see that together. The flow then turns around and goes back. There's a second SCR to make sure that it does a complete cleaning. And when we inject this DEF, or ammonia, some of it gets through the system. So the last thing that they have there is uh, ASC. It's an um, ammonia slip catalyst to clean up any ammonia that has escaped. Um, what we know is that these systems work very well when they're hot. Um, but before the engine heats up, uh, they're not as efficient. So really, what the new technologies have added is simply a preheater. And this is a close-up view of the injection, and you can see this representation of heating of the SCR to make it more efficient. And in terms of the uh, NOx emissions, the blue line at the top is the engine out, uh, the second line is under normal operation, and the third line is with the heating of the SCR. And it satisfies future NOx emissions, just as Jeff showed for the BMW 3 Series. Here's another solution. This is from uh, FEV and the supply company Benteler. Um, 
So they, they get this thing about how we need more heat into the system, so they've moved it up closer to the turbocharger to get the heat of the engine instead of having an external heater. Um, the exhaust manifold is uh, it's, it's a unique new design. It has two walls with an air gap in between. It's exactly like your storm window at home, your winter windows, where the air gap acts as an insulation. So because we have this insulation, the heat goes into the uh, exhaust system more efficiently it, and uh, the, exhaust is, the exhaust cleaning is more efficient. Here we see their results. <clears throat> the left side is for CO2 and the right side is for NOx, so let's focus on that. At the top we see what's coming out of the engine and below you can see the limit of 80 milligrams per kilometer and how we're well below that. The new emissions for interest um, have what we call a conformance factor and when they come in uh, later this year the conformance factor will be 2.1. So actually the car companies don't need to meet 80 milligrams, they need to meet 80 times 2.1. That will be reduced to 1.5 after three years, so it's a phasing in. So they're well below the emissions requirement for out in 2022. And this is under these so-called RDE, real driving experience conditions, not the, uh, the testing inside the laboratory. Another one now, this is, uh, there's six of them, so we'll just work our way through them. This is from Bosch, same kind of thing, a diesel oxidation catalyst, SCR, but they have two types. The one in the upper right corner, you can see it starts with green. Um, the idea there is that they also take away a little bit of the NOx in that first step. They want to reduce it by about 30% so that the SCR will be more efficient, right? They don't overwhelm it. So there's a couple of ideas going here. One is preheating and other is kind of pre-treatment to take away a little bit of the NOx so that you don't hit the SCR so hard and it can be more efficient. And their results in the bottom, this first on the left is for the world harmonized uh, light duty vehicle test cycle. On the left, it's the transport for London with a lot of stop-start. And you can see the blue system for engine out um, after the first treatment step and at the end of the system. Um, it's interesting, the third bar with the hash, that's the one where they also add preheating. So you can see again how effective the preheating is at reducing NOx. There are solutions. Um, AVL, similar idea, um, they're putting a lean NOx trap before the SCR, so they have two steps of reducing, still have the ammonia slip catalyst at the end. You can see their results just in the bottom corner there, uh, conformance factors below one, certainly below the 2.1 that's required in uh, 2017. I did speak to the AVL people, and they said that if they add heating, they will have another step down. So, and then, a very different, a really interesting proposal from uh, Denso in Japan. So you can see now they put the, the DOC up close to the engine to get the heat, but this time they're not using SCR. They're using a lean NOx trap, which is a cheaper technology, which is typically applied to smaller vehicles. And, but they found that if they inject ozone, the lean NOx trap is more efficient. So oxygen is O2, ozone is O3, and we can see their results. You have on the top in black the engine out um, with a normal system in red and then with the ozone injection the blue. A lot of different solutions coming to the market. And finally this is from uh, Southwest Research Institute in the United States. You see this same stacking of the different things that we have in the toolbox but they have introduced this uh, uh, thing called PNA. It's a passive NOx adsorber. The idea is simple. It will store all of the NOx until the engine gets warm and the exhaust system gets warm and becomes more efficient. When the exhaust system is up to temperature, they start letting the NOx escape. And interestingly, you can see just after the PNA, this little MB, this is mini burner. So if they need more temperature, they just divert a little bit of the diesel fuel, burn it into the system, raise the temperature, make the system more efficient. And this is actually, uh, you can see it's from the US because they refer to DEF instead of AdBlue. Um, but this is for 15 liter truck application. And you can see their, their plot is quite busy, but the traditional uh, systems for cleaning and all of the things that they've done new and down the furthest point, they're below the target for 2025. Yeah. 
So one year later, so many solutions. I simply don't understand how policymakers can start talking about banning diesel in 2025 before we've had eight years to introduce solutions. If we do this in one year, imagine where we will be. And as Jeff said, the OEMs need it because it's the most cost-effective way for them to meet CO2 legislation. Uh, Okay, I'd like to look a little bit at uh, the market forecast. Many different companies have issued market forecasts, and I just took one as an example. Again, it's from Continental, but it, it, it's quite agreeable with the others. So what they're showing is from 2015 to 2030, the breakdown of different uh, powertrain types, um, gasoline in the yellow gold color, and diesel in red. What, what I would like to point out here is the diesel, diesel doesn't change that much. What does the market see generally? Um, these emission systems will cost more. Um, on a small vehicle that costs maybe 15 to 20,000 euros, that's going to be difficult. On a larger vehicle where we need more CO2 reduction, uh, luxury sedans, SUVs, pickups, they will certainly be able to tolerate the on cost and this will become the favored technology for larger vehicles. Okay. Interestingly also, above the diesel, we start to see this uh, onset of the use of alternative powertrains. So it is 48 volt, it is uh, mild hybrids, full hybrids, plug-in hybrids, and finally fully battery electric vehicles. And this agrees with most of the forecasts. Out in 2030, people are generally less than 20%, uh, sorry, less than 10% fully electric vehicles. So that means more than 90% of vehicles ha will have an internal combustion engine because all of these hybrids and the 48 volt systems, they're all based on normal internal combustion engines. And maybe the way that the diesel takes that last step down is to complement with a 48 volt system, which Jeff nicely showed was one of the cheapest or at least costly ways of achieving the target. Right, so that's for cars. Um, let's look at trucks just for a moment. So this is a quote from Alan Schaefer. He's a good friend of Jeff. So Jeff is in Washington representing uh, the passenger car diesels and his members are the supply community. Alan Schaefer primarily works with commercial vehicles and his members are the OEMs. So they're two different organizations, both looking at the future of diesel. And he made a very powerful quote, he says, when, when talking about the challenges for the future, no power source can meet these challenges as reliably and cost-effectively as diesel. This is why diesel today powers 98% of Class 8 commercial trucks and why it will continue to do so for decades to come. So we spent a lot of time addressing cars and then just one quick quote about trucks. We've said that trucks is our biggest growth area and we see no risk and no challenge to diesel in that application. So we spent a lot of investing, a lot, invested a lot of time on that part of the presentation, but I, I really wanted to try to balance again this difference between the perception of diesel and the potential of diesel. And perhaps Sintercast has to start to do a better job of bringing that message, uh, not just to the shareholders, but also to the policy makers. Right. Let's talk about our tracking technologies. Last year at the AGM, it was a, a fun thing to introduce this new technology to the shareholders. At that time, we referred to it as Ladle Tracker. One year later, we refer to it as our tracking technologies because we now have different applications of it. Um, the Ladle Tracker, we've had a good year of development, both technically and commercially. And the roots of this technology are similar to our CGI technology. It's precision measurement, it's process control, and process efficiency. So the ladle tracker ensures that every step in the foundry process is successfully completed within the set limits. Um, it shows the foundry managers where any ladle falls out of the process and also shows them the reason why it falls out of the process. And that allows them then to address that problem, to eliminate the problem area and to eliminate the bottlenecks. Um, in a foundry, if we melt the iron and we pour 1,000 ladles over at the melting area, 
Those ladles will move through the foundry process, and we would also like to pour 1,000 of them to make castings, but 1,000 of them don't arrive at the finish line. There's always some that fall out of the process, and every ladle that falls out is money. And this is a system that can identify why and where it fell out, help the foundry improve its efficiency. So we, we think it's a really neat technology. Again, it goes back to the same thing. You can't control what you can't measure. And if we show them where their problems are, they'll better be able to fix their problems. Uh, in discussion with our customers and in our internal discussions, we developed a second application of this, which we call Cast Tracker. So imagine a molding line going through the middle of a foundry. On one side of the molding line, we melt the iron, we put it into a ladle, it goes through the treatment steps and it comes over to pour into the, into the mold. And Ladle Tracker takes care of that, the traceability of the full metal history. But on the other side of the molding line, we're preparing the sand. Yes, yeah, so we take the sand and with some resin or binder, we press it together and we make the sand cores. And here you can see a mold with three cylinder block packages already in the mold and one core set that's exploded. So the idea is that as we make these cores, we will label and register every one of them. So we produce the cores, we label them, they go on the shelf. Sometime later, the foundry will take them off the shelf and put them into the mold. So we know the moment they were made, we call that the inception. We know the moment when they were put into the mold so we can calculate the shelf storage time. And then that sand mold will go down the molding line until it comes to the pouring point. The iron will go in, we call this the birth event. And at that point we can connect to the ladle tracker and we have complete traceability of the process. It means that the OEM can go to a car, scan the vehicle identification number, and from that he will know the minute that the cores were made, the minute that the ladle was poured, and the full metal history. So it's really industry 4.0 uh, for the foundry industry. So as I say, we think it is a really neat technology. It gives control in the foundry and confidence to the end user. Uh, we have also extended to develop what we call operator tracker. The idea is that we will measure the performance of every operator. We'll have a little RFID tag on the operator. When he approaches a, uh, a station, it will register that he is there and that he has performed the task. Um, there are a lot of reasons in the foundry for scrap and for inefficiency. And the consistency and the behavior of the operator is clearly one of those reasons. So by tracking who performed each operation, we can set targets and we can measure performance. Um, we can reward good performance. We can prescribe additional training if someone needs improvement. And if someone just isn't able to the job, we can reassign them to a different task. Yeah? We can't afford to have someone making mistakes and costing the foundry money. And this is a way to measure that performance. Um, our customers in the car industry do it. They track the operators who are assembling the vehicles and assembling the engines. And we as the foundry community have to have the same level of technology that our customers do. So uh, we believe in our growth and we're not saturated. The pipe looks good. Um, pickups, as Jeff said, are still the most popular vehicles in the US. This is a statistic showing the actual sales in the first four months of the year. Um, the top three vehicles are once again pickups. For as long as anyone is brave enough to forecast, they remain as the top three vehicles. Um, it's very interesting that on an engine equivalent basis, the US pickup market is bigger than the entire German car market. Yeah, and Germany is the biggest market in Europe. So it's a wonderful big market. We're very well positioned. We have two of the five engine options in the Ford F-150. The VM Motori coming back for Ram. We have the Nissan V8 diesel as well. And um, so it's a great growth opportunity for us. Um, we will grow in each of the categories. I mentioned earlier that we will deliver on wave three, we'll fill the five waves. So that's uh, very nice for us to be able to close the circle on the vision that we set 15 years ago. 
Um, tracking technologies, we're all very excited about the tracking technologies. We think that it's a really neat technology that uh, fits with our high-tech uh, measurement and control image. Uh, we're quite busy now with uh, technical development, busy with uh, customer discussions. Um, we presented the technology at the American Foundry Society meeting last month. It will be presented at the Ductile Iron Society meeting later this month and at the German Foundry Conference uh, in June. Um, we really believe in this. Uh, we think that it is something that will develop very positively. So we'll continue to develop it as a product and also as a business. Um, installations, there are always installation opportunities. The picture in the top left is the new installation of the Texeed Foundry in Brazil. Uh, the second picture is the uh, ladle tracker test that we've been running at a steel mill here in Europe. Uh, it's on a 300 ton ladle. So we'll have new installation opportunities for CGI um, capacity and functionality upgrades. We have discussions ongoing for ladle tracker and cast tracker and operator tracker at fairly advanced uh, levels. And some of those discussions are of course with foundries that don't use our CGI technology. So it's an opportunity for us to expand to new customers um, and also to steel mills. Last year at the AGM, uh, our guest speaker was Professor Jolly from Cranfield University in the UK. Um, he has now published his research. He waited for the Vienna Motor Symposium to publish it because again, that is the big one and it's, it's the right place for him to do it. Um, his research was very powerful. Yes, aluminum engines are lighter. Yes, therefore they use less fuel. However, aluminum also uses much more energy in the production phase. And what he showed is that that energy that's needed for the production, it never pays back. The weight saving that you have and the lower fuel consumption on the road can never compensate. Um, he showed break-even distances between 150,000 kilometers in the best case scenario to more than 800,000 kilometers. So the interesting thing is that, uh, again, legislation. Um, legislators uh, legislate for tailpipe emissions. It motivates the OEMs to use lighter materials to reduce the fuel consumption and the CO2 emissions. But when they do it, they actually make more CO2. Yeah. And again, it's a message that Sintercast has to help Professor Jolly to distribute. Um, he will write four more papers on this research. Two of them will go into referee journals for sustainability. Um, and that peer review process will give credibility to the research. He will write a five-page paper, which is due by the end of this month, for the automotive journals and also a 750 word article which will be distributed to the newspaper so that we get the message uh, both to the man on the street, to legislators, and to industry. Okay, and finally a milestone that uh, we're all really proud of. Uh, this year we reach uh, 100 million crowns of cumulative dividend. You know, uh, for the first time, the employees are here at the AGM this year, at least the Katharina home-based employees, those who aren't traveling this week. Um, so we work because we enjoy our technology and we enjoy the industry. Uh, we work because it's a neat thing. It's a neat challenge to develop things and to install them and have them work and to get the positive feedback from the customer. Um, it's also very fun to see Sintercast CGI vehicles on the road, but, but overall, it, we work to provide a return to the shareholders. And some of us, we are employees, but all of us are shareholders. Thank you.